as we have turned to Exodus chapter 50, and we're going to read at verse 15 in just a second. Over the last uh, six weeks, we've been in this collection of teachings called Strength for Every Season, right? Just as nature has seasons, your life has seasons. There's life uh, seasons of, of, of celebration, and there's life seasons of pain. There's seasons of hard work, and there's seasons of rest. There's uh, seasons of, of great challenges, and there's seasons of great testimonies, right? And so we are in this collection of teachings called Strength for Every Season. We're studying the life of Joseph because we find that in the life of Joseph, we can find how he found strength, and we can uh, apply it to our lives and live out how to find strength in every season. It's a story of Joseph. I love this story. It's a story of rags to riches. It's a story of... Uh, test and tragedy to triumph. It's a story of the pit to the prison to the palace. And in this final message with you from the story of Joseph this morning in our collection of teaching, I want to share with you the destiny season. This is the title of my message this morning, the destiny season. So if you would go to Genesis chapter 50, verse 15, I want to remind you that you can also follow along uh, with our sermon notes on the Victory Church app. Please do that. Note takers are history makers. This morning, let's read verse 15. You can follow along with me, or if you have your electronic device, follow along. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus shall you say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespasses of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you... You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about to this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his, fa and his father's household. And Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation, the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were also brought up on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for your word today. We are grateful for the opportunity to gather around your word, Lord, to hear what you would say to us today. Father, thank you, Lord, for your promise that says um, that your word will accomplish that which is sent out to accomplish. It won't return to you void. So, Father, we thank you today. Lord, for what you're going to do in our hearts and our life. Lord, we are open, we are receptive to what you have for us today. Lord, let us not leave this place, Lord, just having sang a song, heard a sermon, or attended a service, but let us leave this moment today having heard from heaven, heard from your heart, experiencing your presence and your power. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. As I said, I love the fall season. I love all that comes with it, the colder weather, the, uh, the changes in the leaves, the beautiful uh, scenery. I love uh, bonfires. I love flannels. I love pumpkin pie. Come on. I love fires and, and all the good things. Hey, you know what I even love? I even love deer season. I don't know anything about it, but I know right now it's bow season, and a lot of y'all have been out hunting. Um, but one of the things that I'm most excited for in this season and some of you are going to have to bear with me, uh, is that it is NCAA men's basketball season. And some of y'all don't like sports, 
So you're just going to hang in there with me for a second. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. And if I'm going to talk about the NCAA men's basketball season, then I've got to tell you about my North Carolina Tar Heels. Come on. Growing up in Hampton Roads, Virginia, they were on every Saturday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whenever they had a big game. And, um, and so I grew up as a Tar Heel fan. The last time that you saw, that I saw the Tar Heels, however, on the court, uh, they were walking off the court experiencing a difficult loss at the hands of the Kansas Jayhawks in the championship game. Nobody better clap right now. Okay, no Kansas <laughs> fans. All right, good. And uh, it was a great season for the Tar Heels, but listen, I, I was certain at the end of the first, if you watch this game, at the end of the first half, the Tar Heels were up by like 15 points. I mean, they were just dominating. They were executing. Uh, they were cruising to a certain victory, another championship banner to hang up in the Smith Center. But what happened, what had happened was, Kansas came out in the second half. They were aggressive. Come on, they were determined. They were ready to take it to the Tar Heels. And what got the Tar Heels the lead in the first half was not what they were doing at the beginning, especially of the second half. So they lost the lead because they weren't executing what they had uh, been doing in the first half. I mean, they started turning the ball over. Uh, they were missing shots. They weren't playing team defense. And it wasn't that they, 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 they lost the lead, but it, it wasn't that they lost the lead because um, they had a lack of talent, they had a lack of scores, they had a lack of intelligence. Um, they had an excess, an abundance of talent, of, of skill set, of potential. But they lost the lead and eventually lost the game because they didn't execute. And listen, you can have excess, you can have uh, abundance, you can have skills, you can have a lot of potential. But if you don't do the thing that got you to the place of success in which you find yourself, there is great potential for you to lose. And the Tar Heels ended up losing that game. They could have experienced the win, but they took a loss <laughs> because they didn't faithfully execute for both halves right? And so this is a principle. This is a truth even uh, from the Word of God that I want to share with you from our text today. And we look at the life of Joseph that he uh, ends up in the palace and he's in his destiny season. This is the principle, the truth that we can get from this text. When given access to excess, execute faithfulness. <laughs> execute faithfulness. Joseph had interpreted Pharaoh's dream. He had uh, been rejected by his brothers. He had been abandoned. He found himself in, in, a, in a time of loneliness, in a painful uh, situation when he was thrown into the pit. And the pit wasn't it, but God brought him out of the pit. But as soon as he brought him out of the pit, he was transferred as a slave into Egypt. And though he became a slave in Egypt, and he eventually became a prisoner in Potiphar's house. He had prison realities, but he still held on to his palace dreams. You see, God wants us to hold on to hope. He wants us to hold on to the dreams, to the, to the hope that we have in Jesus. Things are going to get better if we'll hang on and not hang up. And God brings Joseph into the prison. And Joseph goes into an intense season in which um, he is forgotten seemingly, where his life is being wasted. He has 12 years in that prison in which he is waiting. He is holding on to his dreams. And then all of a sudden, the knucklehead known as the butler, whom he helped out in the prison, remembers him when he's back in Pharaoh's palace. Pharaoh has a dream. He has a dream of uh, these, these cows, and, and these skinny cows ate the fat cows. And, and eventually, uh, 
it, 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 nobody in his whole kingdom could interpret it. And so the butler remembered, hey, there's this guy in prison that I met that interpreted my dreams, and he calls him out of the prison in Genesis uh, chapter 41, verse 14. His prison sentence is coming to an end. He entered the prison, but now he's being called out of his painful prison season. And he stands before Pharaoh, and he says these words. It's incredibly uh, powerful in Genesis chapter 41, uh, verse 14. Pharaoh sent and called to Joseph, and they brought him out quickly out of the dungeon. And he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said that you can interpret and understand a dream. So Joseph answered Pharaoh and said, It is not in me, but God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And Joseph interprets this dream with God's help to the Pharaoh. His gift, come on, the scripture says, your gift will make room for you. But how many of you know that your gift, your abilities, your intelligence, your strength, come on, your, your ability to connect with people, your, your ability to do uh, math or to be able to do sales or to be able to teach, all of these gifts that you have are gifts that come from God. God is the source of your gifts, and your gifts will make room for you. Your gifts will get you into the palace. It'll get you into the room, but your character will keep you in the room. You see, because when you've been given access to excess, you have to execute faithfulness. Because if you don't have the character to keep you in the room, then you'll fall back into a difficult season. But we find that Joseph has found himself, and now he's in a position to be in a destiny season. In fact, Pharaoh puts a ring on his finger. He puts a robe on his back. He makes him in, puts him in the second command over all of Egypt. And there's no one in Egypt that is greater than Joseph. He's given power and prestige. He's given position. He's given wealth. But to whom much is given, much is required. And I think that oftentimes in our destiny season, the destiny season, I would define it, let me define it as this. Destiny season is a season of success. It's a time uh, in, in your life in which you're experiencing the tangible and intangible blessings, the favor of God. And it could be a tangible blessing like you've got a recent promotion on your job. It could be an intangible blessing like you were praying for a, 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 a girlfriend or a boyfriend and God brought the right person in your life. That's an intangible blessing. Or it could be that you're going through a difficult time and you're in prayer one night and you're praying to God and he deposits peace and joy in your heart and hope in your heart knowing that things are going to get better eventually. That is the intangible, the tangible blessings that come into our life as a result of the destiny season. But I think that perhaps if if you've experienced seasons of winning, seasons of success like I have, the tendency and the temptation is in the winning or the destiny season or the successful season. The tendency for us is to forget God in the destiny season. You see, we forget that God is the one who has brought us into a place of blessing. We forget that God is the one who is the source of our strength that has brought us into this particular season that we are on the mountaintop. But I love that song, the old song, that old hymn that says, he's the God of the mountain and he's the God of the valley. We have to remember not to forget the Lord when we're on the mountaintop as we don't forget the Lord when we're in the valley. And if we're going to find strength in our destiny season as Joseph has found himself in the destiny season in Genesis chapter 50 here, he's at the, in the last days of his life. And he's faithfully had character throughout his life that has sustained him. We never see uh, Joseph going back into the pit. We never see him going back into the prison. We never see him uh, going through uh, those, those early years of struggle and of trial and of testing and of waiting. 
We find him in this destiny season. And we find that it is instructive for our life that we can remain in the destiny season. We can find strength in the destiny season by remaining humble. This is my first point. And if you're taking notes, I want you to remain humble in the destiny season. Now, notice I said remaining, right? That's a continuous verb. The ing makes it continuous. Remain. Rem re remain faithful. Remain humble in the destiny season. See, Joseph could be humble in the destiny season because he stayed humble in the destiny season. Listen, listen. This reality is Joseph acknowledged and honored God throughout his journey. And that's why we find in Genesis chapter 50, he has remained faithful to stay humble to God after all of these years because he has acknowledged, let me give you this definition of, of humility. He's acknowledged God as the giver and sustainer of everything that he is, possesses, and will be. Hmm. This is countercultural in our life. It's counterculture to our nature. When we get a season of success, we want to get the credit. We want to hashtag winning. We want to hashtag the blessed life. And in this society, in this culture in which we live, this social media-driven society, we want to make posts and we want to share our blessings. We want people to look out how great we are and how much we've accomplished and how wonderful life is for us. And yet I wonder sometimes if we have forgotten God is the one who has brought us into the destiny season, into a place of success. The danger of the destiny season is forgetting God, and also it's, it's, it's having a false definition of success. Hmm. And success, I like to talk about the false uh, definition of success by, by, by bringing you to this truth. The reality is that we idolize success, number one, as if it came from self. Success comes from God. And, 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 and when we don't recognize God and the source of our success, then we become prideful. Then we become arrogant. We think that we got here by ourselves. But secondly, false success is not just idolizing success as if it came from us. Uh, uh, succeeding at, we, we idolize success when we succeed at what is less important in life. Oh, you could be, have a successful season in your work. You can get a raise. You can get a promotion. Come on. But you can be unsuccessful because that job takes you away from your family. That job takes you away from faithfulness to God to attend church. That, that seemingly uh, promotion, that thing that has brought you success, is actually something that has brought a curse on your life has limited the success that God really wants you to have and, and the really the blessing that he has on your life because you begin to worship success and idolize success instead of the giver of the success. When we are blessed, we have to thank God not just for the blessing but for the giver of the blessing. We have turned our blessings into an opportunity for us to take credit for something that we did not cause. Listen to what the scripture says in Romans chapter 1, verse 25. It talks about um, how people have turned against God, and this is what they did. They exchanged, in Romans chapter 1, verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped, listen to this, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And the solution for us not to idolize our success and not to forget God in our destiny season is to remain humble by remaining in the presence of God. Remain humble by remaining in the presence of God. This is what it looks like. When I go through a season in which I am successful and I'm, and I'm being blessed of God and I'm being uh, rewarded and God is working in and through my life, I can't forget God. I can't forget what brought me there. I've got to acknowledge God and I've got to enter into his 
presence. Not occasionally, but faithfully. This means daily I'm remaining humble, I'm praying, I'm getting on my face before God, I'm opening up His Word. Come on, I'm, I, I'm spending time with God, I'm serving people, I'm attending church faithfully. How many of people do you know that when they become successful, they get the boat? They get the car. They take the vacations. And I'm not against any of those things, but I'm against those things having you and limiting the blessing and the presence and the success that God really wants to manifest in your life as you remain humble and as you seek him. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5 through 6, it says this. Uh, uh, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. When given access to excess, execute faithfulness. Finding strength in the destiny season is remaining humble. Secondly, uh, finding strength in the destiny season is releasing my past releasing my past. We find Joseph's brothers fearful, thinking he is going to take revenge on them, right? And so they come to him, they make up, many uh, commentators believe that they made up this story. Hey, your father says, they're trying to appeal to uh, uh, Joseph's relationship with Jacob, and he's, they're trying to appeal uh, to his relationship with him to get them favor, and they're worried. They remembered all the terrible things that they did to him. They hated him, they put him in a pit, they abandoned him. In this passage right here, it gives us the very first appearance, appearance of the word forgive in the Bible. Let me read it to you once again. He says this. They, they ask, they say, I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of your brothers and our sin. Forgive. This word in forgive in the Bible is so powerful. This word is, the, is a Hebrew word for forgive, and it also means to release, to absolve, to bear up, and to lift up. It's the same word that's used in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 4 through 6, concerning the person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He has borne our sins and carried or lifted up our transgressions, right? Right? The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So we find that God, through Jesus, has released us of our past, and now we have the ability to release others of their past and forgive them. And so I got my keys, because I've got three keys uh, on this keychain this morning, and I've got three keys for you for forgiving others and releasing them um, of, the, of the things that they've done to you. Because you can't walk into your future, you can't stay in the destiny that God has for your life if you're holding on to your past. You've got to let it go. You've got to release it. The release key, this is the first of the release key. It releases a wrongdoer from punishment that they deserve. Now you notice Joseph here, he says, the sin that you did against me, you meant it for evil, he says. So he doesn't give them a pass. He recognizes the fact that they did evil to him, but he's willing to release them anyway. It's been said that holding on to unforgiveness in your heart is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Release the people in your past for the wrong that they've done to you. And when you do, you have the key that will get you out of the prison of unforgiveness that you find yourself in. The second key is the receive key. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12 through 15. Um, it says this. Let me read it to you. These are the words of Jesus. This is his prayer, the Lord's prayer. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Listen to this, verse 14. This is how powerful and important forgiveness is to Jesus. For if you forgive men of their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 
But if you do not forgive men of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The question is not um, what God says about forgiveness, what Jesus says about forgiveness. The question is, do we believe it? You can't give something to others that you yourself do not possess. So if you're going to give forgiveness, you've got to receive first forgiveness from God. Because I, I, I want to let you know today, you're not always perfect and you've hurt people along the way. And God, through his mercy and his grace, forgave you. And he's asking us now to release others, release our past by forgiving them. Release them, receive forgiveness from God, and finally, believe, the believe key. The believe key says this, I believe that Jesus has forgiven me. The Bible says, right, that he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus. Releasing a wrongdoer positions me to uh, receive forgiveness, freedom, and favor from God. (laughs) finding strength in your destiny season is not just remaining humble, releasing your past, but it's also remembering God's providence. Here's what I love in this story. Here's Joseph's response. But as for you, you meant it as evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about this day to save many people alive. There's another passage in the New Testament that's the parallel to that, and it's Romans chapter 8, verse 28. You might have heard it before. And it says, we know that all things work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I like to illustrate this uh, this morning by something I was thinking about this week as I was preparing this message. How many of y'all enjoy Costco pot pie? Come on, in Jesus' name. It's of the Lord. And um, my wife brought one of those home. I said, let's throw it in the oven right now. Like, let's eat. (laughs) And I like to explain, um, remembering God's providence, I like to explain providence in this way. First, I'm going to define it to you. I'm going to illustrate it for you. Providence is the way in which God preserves and governs everything in the universe to bring about his intended ends, both in spite of and through the actions of sinners. All things working for your good. Not that all things are good, but all things working toward your good because God loves you and he's got a plan in his divine providence. He uses even the evil things, even the, the, the unappealing things that were used against you for your good. Joseph said, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. And so we throw that pot pie in the oven. It's got a multitude of ingredients in there. Come on, y'all. It's got the crust. Maybe you don't like crust. Amen. I love the crust. It's got the filling in there, right? It's got the carrots in there. It's got the peas. It's got the chicken, the rotisserie, and it's good. But if you look at the ingredients that are found, like if you look at the ingredients on the, don't do it, but if you want to, like you can look at that, cornstarch, flour, salt, sugar, butter, right, like eggs, all of these things, individually these ingredients would not taste good in and of themselves. If you put them on a spoon and you were asked to eat them, they would not taste very good. But God's providence is working in this way in Joseph's life and in my life and in your life. You see, God is like the baker. He's putting all these ingredients the hurts, the pains, the pits, the prisons, the trouble, the being looked over, being rejected. He's using the successes. Come on, he's using the abundance. He's using the winds. And he's bringing all these things together for a delicious meal that you get to enjoy. He brings together all these individual things that might not seem good in the time, but he uses them together for your good as something that eventually you will look back and say, man, that was good. It might not seem good, but it was good. Amen? So God will take the carrots of your situation, I wrote this down, the butter of your circumstances, the flour of your failure, and the sugar of your successes. 
mix them all together in his divine providence and come out with a pot pie that tastes great. Remembering God's providence requires us to trust in his goodness. It's working out for your good. And finally, as PL will come, finding strength in the destiny season is finally this. It's resting in God's promise. Resting in God's promise. It's remaining humble, releasing the past. It's remembering God's providence. And it's resting in God's promise. Joseph has dealt with his past, and now he's making provisions for his future. He's talking to his brothers and his grandchildren. He's gathering them all around, and he makes them promise to him, look, I'm getting ready to die, but when I die, here's what I need you to do. You see, there was something that took place in Genesis chapter 47 in Jacob's life. And the Lord appeared to Jacob, his father, and gave him a dream. And in that dream, the Lord showed Jacob that there was difficult times yet to come. There was going to be 400 years in Egypt in which they were going to be slaves. It was going to be the darkest time that the nation of Israel had ever experienced. It was going to be a time of hopelessness. It's a time of slavery. It's a time of hard and of difficulty. And Joseph, in that moment, looking into the future, remembers what his father told him. You can read about it, and I'll read it again. In verse 24, it says, And Joseph said to his brothers, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. This was him recalling the promise of God over his life and over his family many years before. And Joseph dies believing that God will visit his people one day and take them to a better land. Joseph had a confession in his promise in God. He had a confession and he also had a coffin. You see, because when he died, he said, I want you to, to put me in this coffin and even in the years to come, when you're in slavery, when you're going through hardship, I want you to remember what God said. I want you to remember that though there might be difficult days ahead, I am with you and I'm going to bring you out because I am the God who keeps my promise. Joseph, he rested in the promises of God. And you and I need to do the same. We'll remain restless until we rest in God's promise. What is his promise? Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 28 through 29, Don't be amazed at this, for the time is coming when those who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. The fact is, we're all leaving this world, but death, is not the end. My question for you is, what legacy are you leaving? The destiny season is a season in which you leave a legacy. Are you going to rest in the promise of God? Are your children going to see you remain humble? Do you have a testimony where you've released others of their transgressions, of their sins? Are you remembering and telling the story of God's faithful promise and his providence that has brought you to this place today. In 1994, I read this story in 1994, a 67-year-old carpenter named Russell Herman died in Marion, Illinois. And in his last will and testament, he bequeathed the following, $2.4 billion to the town of Cave and Rock, $2.4 billion to the city of East St. Louis, $1.5 billion for projects in southeastern Illinois. And in the final act of unprecedented generosity, he left $6 trillion to the Federal Reserve to pay off the national debt. There was only one problem. At the time of his death, the only thing he actually owned was a 1983 Olds Tornado. <laughs> hmm. 
Russell Herman may have not left behind anything of monetary value, but he did leave us with a good reminder. You cannot give away what you do not possess. <laughs> the bottom line is, we have these promises of God. They're not our promises, but they're promises that God will keep. And in a world of broken promises, we serve a God who has never failed in keeping his promise. He can be counted on. When we rest in God's promise, it's a reward for those who keep his promise. For the God who keeps his promise will bring us rest as we rest in his promises. All across this room this morning, I know that God speaks through his word in unique ways. And you might have a, be going through a difficult season. Maybe you're going through a waiting season. Maybe you're going through a doubting season that we've talked about. Maybe you're going through a season of testing. Others of us are in this place today and we're going through a season that is a destiny season. We're experiencing success. We're experiencing healing. We have breakthroughs of, you know, great people in our life that encourage us, come around us, and that are a blessing to us. A lot of us have kids that are just doing great, and we're experiencing a destiny season. I don't want any of us to forget God, though, in our destiny season by making an idol out of the success that we're experiencing. The tendency for God's people is to do such a thing because we don't remain humble. We have a trouble releasing our past. We don't remember God's providence like we should and we fail and we neglect to rest on God's promise. I want to take time right now to acknowledge the Lord in our life as being the God of every season and of every time and of every place that I might find myself in walking through today. What if, as an opportunity this morning, we responded to the appeal of God today? What if we said, God, I'm going to forgive? What if we said, God, I'm going to humble myself? God, I'm not going to forget you. God, I'm going to remember how far you've brought me. And God, for the days ahead, I'm going to rest in your promise.